Our next speaker is Janet um, Alder, and Janet has been a campaigner for justice um, after the police um, brutally murdered her brother in 1998. And I'm presuming that Janice is somebody else who's a victim of collateral intrusion, which is absolutely, you know, uh, terrible. Um, but Janice is going to tell us um, about, you know, why she's got involved in these issues. Um, yeah, um, right. I feel as if I should be part of the Pitchford inf inquiry as well, um, but for some unknown reason, they're not allowing me to be a core participant in it. Now, my brother was murdered by the Humberside Police in 1998. Um, police officer had come to my door, where I was living at the time, told me that Christopher had died in police custody. And I then made a decision to go to Hull and find out what was going on. And I approached the police, you know, at the police station, and it just didn't, it, it didn't feel right. I didn't feel right, the, you know, the way it treated me like a victim or, you know, it just didn't feel right. And they'd left me sat in the foyer for about an hour. And then eventually, this detective come through and he showed me through to the back of the police station. I'd asked him what had happened to Christopher and he just, um, he was just sat in a chair with his knee up and chewing, <coughs> chewing gum and he, done, he, did, he seemed totally disinterested in, do you know what I mean, what had gone on and he just basically said, your brother had been ins assaulted outside of a nightclub due to his injuries, he died. So, and I asked him, I said, well, how many police officers was involved and do you know, you know, where was Christopher at the time and whatsoever. So he picked up the phone and he said, and he just listened and then next minute he, he said to me, I've just asked them, I said, well, I never saw you ask them anything. You know, so, but something had come over his radio at that time about, you know, somebody being murdered. So I thought, well, you know, there's my opportunity to go. I was, I was absolutely petrified, to tell you the truth. You know, that, you know, police stations are quite intimidating buildings, you know, especially when you not really have that much involvement in them and whatsoever. I mean, we're brought up to fear the police type of thing. So, but then I walked out and then um, I'd gone to the whole Daily Mail and I picked up, like, all the newspapers for the week that Christopher died and he was he was on the front page every day and at the bottom it kept saying and we've got a man in connection with his death yeah and some of them you know some of the newspapers said oh murder inquiry and I'm thinking a murder inquiry they just told me that he died in police custody and it collapsed sat next to a police officer so I decided to go to the hospital because what had happened Christopher had been punched that night at the nightclub it fell, bumped his head, ambulance came, took him to the hospital as a complainant. And when I got up to the hospital, the top consultant had said to me, he came to see me, and I thought, you know, that's really good of him to come out like that. And he just sat there, and he was, you know, he was quite relaxed, and I felt relaxed in his company. And he just said, this is now a murder inquiry, we are bound by law not to say anything. I thought, murder inquiry? They didn't tell me that when I went down to, you know, the police station. So, at this time, they didn't know the cause of Christopher's death. You know, whenever there's a death in custody, all of a sudden medical science goes out the window and they really don't know that person's dad. And um, so what I did then was, I thought, well, next, you know, I went back to my brother's house, went to bed and whatsoever, got up the next morning, I thought, right, I'm gonna get in touch with the coroner's office, find out what's happened to my brother, how his dad and then. So, um, it was at that point that the coroner's, um, off, you know, his junior had said to me, you, you know, you might be better getting a solicitor. And I thought that was kind of strange as well. So, but I wanted to pursue, the, pursue this. So the next day I went to, back to the police station. And at this time, there was um, this particular police officer, you know, told me to go through the back and whatsoever. And he sat there and I just said to him, look, I said, um, I've got outside organisations willing to support the family on this. Because I was absolutely petrified. Yeah. And he reeled his chair off to me, right up to my face, and he went, We don't deal with outside organisations. We deal with the family. 
So I went, whoa, I went, listen, I said, I'm just, I am, I'm Christopher's sister. I don't need to be arguing with you and that lot. So I just got up and left. When I got outside, I started crying because I really didn't know what to do and I was scared. And then um, I calmed down a bit and I thought, started walking into town and I saw Waterstone's bookshop and I went in there. And just as I picked up a book and I just happened to look out at the door and there was a plain clothes police officer. He was in navy blue overalls and like a blue bag house jacket. And the reason I knew he was a copper is because he had a notebook with a badge on. I know I should laugh. And I went, and when I get scared, I get really big mouth and I went, oh my God! I went, I went my brother's dad in police custody. I said, the police are following me. So then everybody went to the door, started following him type of thing. But he went across the road and he was stood there for a bit. And then, you know, the people who said, in the shop said, Janet, you can go now, he's gone. So I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to get a solicitor. I'm really scared, like. So I went to a solicitor's and I saw a guy that had walked through the back of the police station while I was sat waiting. I thought, oh, shit, you know. So I went into a solicitor's and I said, look, I said, the police are following me. I said, it's like the Gestapo. I said, they're following me. So. And I showed her the newspaper clipping, she went, they've done it, haven't they? I said, yeah, they've done it. I said, they're following me. So she let me out the back door, made me an appointment to come back, let me out the back door. And then I thought, I better get in a taxi. And I jumped in the taxi and I was still panicking. I went to the guy. I said, the police are following me. Get, get out. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But then I got into another taxi and I thought, don't say anything, you know. <laughs> got to the top of my brother's road and I saw a little second hand shop and I thought oh I'm just gonna bob in here and that and came out again walking up the road and there was a patrol car facing me I thought oh shit you know and I was really scared so I kind of I bent down in my bag and I just quickly you know ripped, ripped the number of the registration and the lapel of the copper went back into my brother's house and I didn't want to say anything to him because he'd already been intimidated by the police. Eight police officers had got him into a back of the van after his brother had been murdered by them, yeah, and then um, told him he was going where his brother had gone, and that his brother deserved it. Oh my God. So I didn't say anything more to him and that, and so, you know, and I had to go home, I had to go home and look after my kids and whatsoever. And I was that scared, I thought, you know, it, it, at the time I was working, and I thought, I'm going to have to go and see somebody because I'm scared. I think I'm being followed all over the place. So I went into a solicitor's and I told them about it. You know, I just saw somebody I knew. Because I'm thinking to myself, they killed my brother. What are they going to do to me? Yeah, that type of thing. And then um, it just kind of went on from then. What had happened, I got introduced to the IPCC and that lot. But little did I know, they had the boy that punched him in a bail hostel for a month and they were going to charge him with Christopher's murder when all the time they had the video of Christopher dying at the feet. They were going to charge. If I had not walked into the police station, that guy would have been done with murder. So um, so then what had happened after that, um, we'd met up with the IPCC and whatsoever. And I told them, I said, look, I said, the police have been following me. They're on my phone. You can hear when they're on your phone. Yeah, you can yeah. hear all these clicks. You know what I mean? I was leaving a message for somebody on my, you know, on their phone, and it was ending up on my messages. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, there's something going wrong here, like. And there was one particular time, do you know, it been going. This had been going on for at least what four years, I would say. And. What had happened, we'd had a couple of protests outside the police station and things like that, do you know what I mean? But there were no hassle. You know, the first time there was about 150 people and we were angry, of course. You know, we're not gonna, we're there to have a cup of tea and a carry on. We're there to let them know that we wanna know what's happened to my brother. So, um, but there were no trouble, you know, nobody got arrested or anything like that. So what had happened is, um, Little did I know at the inquest they uh, were supposed to have been spying on me. Now, when I told them in 1998, or when I told the IPCC when they did an investigation in 2006 into Christopher's death, they turned around and said, there's no evidence. 
they, they were trying to make out as if I were paranoid. And you can't say anything to anybody because, you know, if you're just meeting, you know, just the ordinary people outside and you try and say something to them, they'll just think that you're paranoid or you're just, you know, you're just going on. Not that I've not had people saying to me, just be careful what you're doing, do you know what I mean? Because they'll come and get you as well. All that was going on in my head at that particular time because this was all new to me. So, um, and then it came out in 2011 when it came out about the Lawrences, Theresa May told um, every police force to go and have a look, see if there was any evidence on the Lawrences, you know, being spied on. And then I found out that I'd been spied on. It came out, you know, and I thought, well, all that time when I knew that we'd been spied on, and they turned around the, and said that I hadn't, and it's come out, yeah? I remember at the trial, we went to the trial in 2004, no, 2002, sorry. There was a police officer in the court foyer, and it was illegal to take photographs, photographing everybody going in. Next minute, there's a picture of my, me and my supporters in the IPCC year, yearly annual. Do you know what I mean? So, it, this had been going on for a long, 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 long time. So this investigation then, that went on afterwards, went on for two and a half years. Two and a half years. It's only just been completed. What had happened, they said that they, that at the inquest, they had um, a viable reason to spy on me. Um, no, the people out, it, with it outside the court, do you know, in front of public order and whatsoever. 60 police officers, and I mean detective constables. I don't mean just PCs or anything like that. Now, on that first day, and well, every day, there was uniformed police officers out there anyhow. So why did they all of a sudden need about, you know, 20 police officers undercover to spy on me? You know, they, they'd even gone way beyond, you know, like the nine till five, and did from five o'clock at night till, do you know what I mean, six o'clock in the morning? So, this investigation's gone on. I mean, the report is there. At this present moment in time, I'm a bit dubious about saying too much about what's in it because we're trying to appeal. I mean, we're not going to win the appeal with the CPS. Not at all. Because what had happened, it had come out because a detective, a female, had come up and said that she was part of this massive big operation against me. And um, it appears that she's given them more information than they're willing to disclose to me and you know that I'm very similar to yourself i'm beginning to question the situation that i was in um do you know while i was fighting for my brother whatsoever because it's quite you know i was quite vulnerable in a lot of ways and um i'm still waiting to find out what's going on about that but as i say it's there 78 pages of it and they have gone way beyond what they should have done. They tried to say that it was, you know, they was watching everybody else, you know, outside, so there was no public order. But this, they were specifically following me all over the place. Me and, well, anybody that were black, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, one of them reported and said, it, oh, it was a sunny day. I remember it was a sunny day and whatsoever. And then the next minute, they says, oh, there was a black guy walking about with glasses on and he just were acting right. <laughs> so I think, it, you know, it was just a case of being guilty of being black and walking down the street type of thing, you know. But, I mean, how can 20 police officers surveil each other, just a small area like that? You know, I know it's been going on a long time. I want to be part of this Pitchford inquiry. Do you know what I mean? There's evidence there, and it's about time it come out. They know exactly what's been going on here. And I, personally, I believe it's going to be another whitewash. And this is why they're picking and choosing who they're going to let in the inquiry and whatsoever. This is basically what they want to learn lessons to make sure they don't get caught again. That's what it is. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.